to another program of U.S. Farm Reports, brought to you by members of the National Farmers Organization in this listening area, in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation. The historic records of the United States government prove conclusively that farm prices must be in balance with other segments of our economy to ensure and maintain a strong national economy. We have as our special guest today, Earhart Fingston, National Vice President of the National Farmers Organization, and Phil Allen, who will discuss the NFO marketing arrangements and their decided effect on improved livestock prices. Hello there. We'd like to talk about the importance of these marketing arrangements, give you a bit of their history, and also uh, Mr. Fingston, who is now the vice president of the NFO, but who was the head of the meat commodity department uh, before this, are going to describe to you just how this kind of a marketing arrangement introduced into livestock marketing, the kind of competition that has sort of fooled the experts. Before we get to Mr. Fingston's analysis of this, I'd like to describe for you the size and scope mm. of these arrangements. We go back more than a year. A year ago this past November, the NFO believes that the first of the marketing arrangements started. Uh, it was probably a felt need that farmers have to find a better service in marketing than they had had when they go into a marketplace all alone and um, submit themselves to that system and sort of act, ask, in effect, uh, what am I going to get? Farmers have come to realize that they know pretty well what they're going to get. So when they discovered that they could get a better service and the National Farmers Organization discovered that in a certain area, farmers could be dealt with better on terms that they like better so that they'd be in control of more of the factors that go into a, a negotiation over livestock. Mm. Then naturally, uh, a farm organization that had any sense of responsibility would say to its members, all right, we think this is a good place for you to market. Never at any time did the NFO say to its members, now don't market here but it's completely consistent with a sense of responsibility for a farm organization to say, all right, it looks as though you'll do well here, so mark it here. This meant that farmers were beginning to favor an area over another, perhaps. Well, this is, this is sort of the history of it, but it's become a very sophisticated modernizing of our marketing system. In trying to describe where all it operates, and to what extent in the key places, I thought that I would review for you some conversations I've had on scheduled television programs around the very heartland of the livestock producing areas with NFO marketing administrators. Uh, not many weeks ago, I talked with Val Ackerland, who is a member of the NFO National Board from the state of Nebraska. He farms about five or 600 acres at Valley has been in the livestock business all his life, and he is the marketing administrator for the NFO in the big Sioux City market and the Omaha market, two of the very largest in the world. When I talked with Mr. Ackerland, he was describing the NFO's gaining experience and how the word was getting around to farmers on both sides of the river and up into South Dakota and Minnesota, where livestock moves into these great markets, and how Part of what was being accomplished in the early days of the marketing arrangements was, was just the sort of informing of, of each other and where NFO members were, by their example, marketing together, showing other farmers who had not belonged to the NFO how it could be to the advantage of farmers working together. It could be to their advantage in a number of ways, but the thing that uh, the people who took part in it first started noticing was that they had a higher or better take-home check. Now, you can hear members of the NFO talking about this. They'll say, that isn't our objective. We like the fact that the take-home check is better. And in a few minutes, when Mr. Fingston talks to you, he can describe some of the reasons for this. But uh, the objective that the NFO people have for marketing together is to build bargaining power in the hands of farmers. But Mr. Ackerland talked about this at great length. 
A week or so later, I had the opportunity to talk with Lester Carr of Rosendale, Missouri. Uh, he is the marketing administrator for 40 counties around the St. Joseph market. And he described how farmers from both the Kansas and Missouri sides and up into Nebraska and parts of southern Iowa were working together to bring their livestock together for the purpose of that market. The St. Joe area has been very interesting in the midsummer of this 1965 season. For one thing, they decided they'd have a demonstration shipment of hogs moving to an eastern market over the old Wabash Railroad. They were working in active cooperation with some folks who, uh, well, they know their way around those old shipping routes along the Wabash, which is now called the uh, Norfolk and Western. And they also know their way around markets over across the Mississippi River. What they were doing there was inducing and interesting farmers in the St. Joseph area in trying out their luck in an eastern market. Uh, one thing they were doing was kind of bringing back some older methods that had fallen into disuse as far as transportation is concerned. At Legro, Indiana, uh, at Griggsville, Illinois, and Legro, Indiana, they reactivated and rebuilt some old railroad shipping points that hadn't been used, I suppose, in a generation. And because they discovered you can get farmers to work together and bring their livestock together, they sort of reactivated these old shipping points along the Wabash. That's another example of the things that were done by the NFO marketing arrangements. Collection points. Collection points were activated in Minnesota, in Candiohi County, in Wilmar, Minnesota, and various places. As I moved down through Missouri, I had another conversation on tele of television with Fred Deerdorf of Ovaz, that's in central Missouri, uh, between Jefferson City and uh, Mexico, Missouri. And I also talked with David Sudsbury, who lives at Holiday, which is near the St. Louis marketing area, and he's administrator for that. Uh, they sort of taught me uh, some of the ins and outs of this discussion that's going on these days about whether it's better to market by grade and yield transactions or whether it's better to market on the hoof. And they were pointing out that farmers were gaining some very good experience with grade and yield transactions and learning that what the processor really buys is a carcass, a carcass that he can market. And uh, farmers are learning and gaining experience with this kind of transaction through NFO marketing arrangements. Then as I moved on up through Iowa, I talked with uh, an administrator of the, as we call it in the NFO, the Waterloo marketing area. It actually includes Cedar Rapids and Ottumwa and some of those northern points in the, in the state of Iowa and southern Minnesota around Mason City. Uh, Bill Talbert is the marketing administrator I talked to there. He described to me how some NFO farmers who were called on the telephone uh, by him or by uh, Mrs. Talbert had finally gotten so enthusiastic about this system that they were making the calls. It was on their initiative that they were bringing their livestock to the attention of our marketing setups within counties. And the contact would first be made with the county meat bargaining chairman. When I talked with uh, three farmers up at Mason City, Iowa, and the conversation was broadcast on the station in Mankato, Minnesota, and KGLO Mason City, uh, several farmers there, Gerald Moss, as I remember, who lives near Mason City, described how he had marketed cattle twice, and he felt that he had gained, as he said, now this is his experience, $500 each shipment more than he would have gained if he had sold as an individual. And one of the farmers who was there on the same program uh, reminded him, yes, Gary, he said, but our reason for marketing together is not just the immediate advantage we might gain in a marketing arrangement. It's the long-range bargaining power that we're building. It seemed to me that those fellows up there by Minnesota uh, had a very good conversation because they they got at the essence of what this marketing arrangement approach is. It isn't just an attempt to market in a, in a different way. It's an attempt to show farmers that by bringing their production together and being in on transactions that um, used to be the subject for a farmer to be told about, 
you know, all such things as weight and grade and yield and price and uh, shipment and all that, when farmers are in on all those negotiations, this is bargaining power. And that's the way these farmers described it to me. Oh, yes, one other point before I get to Mr. Thingston. Bain Dravis, who operates a 775-acre farm at Graham, which is near St. Joseph, was describing one of the newest and latest setups that the NFO has established with the biggest independent packer in the St. Joe market. Uh, Bain was describing to me how this packer sort of specializes in fed cattle, choice grade, and he was describing how the NFO is now supplying this packer and supplying him rather openly, and uh, the arrangement is working out to everyone's satisfaction because this is a, a modern packer. He takes very great pride in his modern methods, not only in slaughter and processing of meat, but also in marketing. Uh, he concluded that what we're gaining is a modernizing of the whole marketing system. I return to one of the observations made by Val Ackerland, the first conversation I had. Mr. Ackerland, the NFO National Board member from Nebraska, pointed out that NFO is now supplying among the very largest packers and that our operations extend over 23 states. And uh, even though this was quite a number of weeks ago, uh, the volume had already reached uh, above the 30,000 mark for hogs. Of course, cattle being a three-year cycle, that would gain rather more slowly than the NFO's marketing arrangements would involve uh, hog supply. Well, I've tried to describe in this way the size and the scope of these market operations. And the NFO is no Johnny-come-lately with this approach to it, as you can now see. We've gained a lot of experience. I'd like to turn now to the vice president of the NFO, Earhart Fingston. And the reason we're talking about this is that Mr. Fingston, before he was vice president of the National Farmers Organization, was head of the meat commodity department. And he had conversations with processors all up and down the line and I suppose he was in on the very first negotiations that set up some of these bargaining committees that have done their bargaining with processors all across the breadth of this country and I think he understands the philosophy of it and just how it is that with this approach to it we've been able to break through that $20 barrier what's that $20 plateau Mr. Pinkston? Well, I suppose you're referring to the prices that had been predicted by the process, not the processors, but the forecasters over the nation who are usually quite accurate. Yes. And uh, this year, of course, in the uh, last winter, early spring, they were forecasting or projecting the amount of livestock that would com be coming to market and, as usual, the prices that they would bring. Now, if you'll recall, they pointed out that by April, our hog prices should reach $16. That by June, we should have prices of $18 per hundred, and that we would hit the peak of $20 per hundred in August. Now, these forecasters were correct in their receipts. They hit that, you might say, on the nose. But in price, they were way off. We had already hit the $20 mark in April when they said that the high would be 16. We had hit the $20 mark in June when the top was supposed to be 18. In fact, we hit $25 in June. And August isn't over, so we don't know at this particular point just how far they do go. But very definitely, the hog prices have advanced at least $5 above the predicted price. And of course, there's it's got to come from someplace. I believe the Wallace farmer in one of their recent issues pointed out, their farm writer, that $5 of this hog market was unaccountable or what couldn't be accounted for on the basis of the receipts. So something had to do it. Well, it was the NFO marketing arrangements because we put competition back into that market. Now, to go back a little to the earlier days that Phil was referring to when I was heading the meat commodity department, 
We, of course, had to know of the problems of the processors, of the market in general, and a very thorough study was made. And one of the very obvious things right at the outset was that the marketing pattern was set. It was in a static condition. Each processor got his supply, let's say 70% of it, from the interior, from buying stations and so forth, and then went to the reservoir where they filled the rest of their needs, the central public markets, who handle probably a little bit less than 30% of the total supply. So it was obvious that this was set. There was no competition there. They didn't have to bid against each other. Each processor had his buying station or his source of supply scattered about the country. They took what came in automatically, filled the balance at the yards. Now, one thing that'll bear this out, I'm going to tell you a little incident that took place. I think it'll probably bring it out as clearly as anything. In the 1962 holding action, I was holding a meeting at Columbus, Ohio, in a sale barn. And, of course, our holding action meetings are usually a little longer than others are because of the interest at the time and, of course, more questions. And a packer, a packer from the East Coast, came into that meeting. I didn't know he was there. But he had to catch a plane out of Columbus at 10 o'clock, and, of course, by 10 o'clock I had done a little more than just finish the general explanation. The question period hadn't ended. But this packer wanted to talk to me. So he left word with the boys in charge of the meeting that he would like to see me at the earliest possible date. Well, since he was from the East Coast and since I was better than halfway across the nation, I decided I'd go there on Sunday and I'd be there on Monday morning. His office faced the street, and this is where I met the gentleman for the first time. I asked him how did he come out buying cattle in Ohio. His needs were 2500 a week, as he had indicated, on the note that he left with our boys. Well, he says, if you look across the street, you can see all that I got. And across the street were three semi-trailer loads of cattle. So this, of course, wasn't very much of the 2,500 that they needed for a week. So I asked him why he didn't go to one of the central public markets that had been so highly publicizing that they had all the cattle that they needed, almost indicating they didn't know what to do with them. Why don't you go there and buy some of your cattle? He said, Mister, I was there for three days and I didn't even get to look at a pen of cattle. As I understood his explanation, the cattle and the hogs, for that matter, on that market were being, let's say, prorated out to the people who had been buying them in, in the period before. And since he had not been a buyer on that market, he couldn't buy any. So he was scared, and I mean really scared, because he was on the East Coast, away from the big supply, and he figured that he was going to have to start dealing with the people who had the cattle if he were going to get any, because he believed that if this would go, the central public, I mean, the central uh, packers would get the total supply. So this further substantiated that there was no real competition in the market at all. That is pretty much a set pattern. Then on the basis of figures available to us and figures supplied to a great extent by our government, indicated that even at the central public markets, the packers buying on that market will buy within a half a percentage point of the total supply year after year. In other words, there is no great variation which would further indicate to me at any rate that the pattern is set, that it is more or less uh, go goes out according to the percentage that they've been buying. Even in the cases of where a packer moved off of a major market, he still seems to get about the same supply of livestock. So what we needed to do was bring more competition back into the market. We had to break up this set pattern of them automatically getting their supply without bidding for it or paying the farmers for it. So this is where the marketing arrangement idea was established. We started at two points before the 1964 holding action. And with those two points, we had an unusual situation. They were processors who believed that the chain stores were going to take over the packing industry as well as agriculture if this situation weren't corrected, that they were under the thumb 
of these chain stores and that they would either be destroyed or be taken over or become, let's say, hired hands of theirs. So they were interested in bringing competition back. So here started our marketing arrangements. We started supplying those two packers, but we couldn't gain much hold elsewhere. We didn't seem to be able to get more packers interested until after the holding action of 1964. This holding action was the one thing that made the Packers realize what a big influence the NFO was out here and the amount of livestock that they did control. While maybe all of them were kidding the public and the newspapers and the um, news media in general saying that they couldn't see any change, they couldn't lie to themselves. They knew that they were in trouble and that the situation was going to have to be reckoned with. And so, of course, here one by one, they started getting ready to do business with the NFO through our marketing arrangement. Now, I pointed out earlier that in the cattle market, we, uh, the price went about $3 above what had been expected, and in the hog market, fully $5 beyond the expected uh, tops that were indicated for the various period. Now, of course, a lot of people have been led to believe that a lot of this is due to a shortage, a shortage of meat. So before I go any further, I want to nail this point down first, just how severe this shortage is. And I have here before me the uh, uh, Iowa Cooperative Crop and Livestock Report for the month of June. This points out, well, I'll read it. Commercial meat production, beef, veal, pork, mutton in Iowa during June totaled 370 million 809,000 pounds, according to the Iowa Crop and Livestock Reporting Services. This, now get this, here's your percentage figures. This is 3% less than June of 1964 production, but 20% more than 1959 to 1963 average of 309 million 689,000 pounds. Meat production during June was 6% more than in May. Estimated meat production includes slaughter in federal inspected plants and in other wholesale and retail plants, but ex excludes farmer slaughter. Then it goes on down, talks about the per, uh, another percentage of in the live weights. It points out that uh, the number of calves slaughtered was 31% more than June 1964, and total live weight increased. Now get this, total live weight increased 15%. The total live weight of hog slaughter and number slaughtered was about the same as a year earlier. Sheep and lamb slaughter was 3% less than in June of 1964. Now, the reason I went over this is to point out to it there is not a shortage, as a lot of people like to make believe have brought about a higher price. So something else had to do it. Well, it was the competition in the market. Now, how did we re-establish competition that had completely left in the market? Let's say that I am in the center of an area. There's a packing plant to the right of me. I am a packer myself, and there's another pack plant to this side. Now, normally we've been getting our supplies perhaps through this same area, different buying points. But now the NFO, through its marketing arrangement, and by making arrangements with individual packers to make sure that they would remain competitive and give the farmers a break and save them some of the costs in marketing that they were paying and getting them nothing, we started to supply these plants by pointing out to our membership that they had an advantage in marketing there. So let's say that I am, well, let's say the plant to the right of me here is the plant that the NFO is supplying. So now he's getting the production that he got through his normal channels, but he's also getting the production from NFO members out of this area here. Now this, ch this makes a change. The packing industry pretty much operates at a 65% of capacity basis. And below this, they lose money. But here's the packer on this side now who is getting the additional production. His capacity goes beyond the 65 per, or his uh, amount he receives, goes beyond the 65%. So he has become more efficient and is in a better position to pay a price 
a fair price for the livestock. But how about this packer now in this position that I'm sitting? His supply has dwindled. He's now down below the 65%. So he's losing, he's losing money. He isn't using his plant to the extent that it must be used to run a profitable business. So what's he going to do? Keep operating at a higher, uh, at a uh, loss, or is he going to shut down? Well, chances are he can't do either one if he has stockholders. So he's got to see to it he gets more supply. Now, how's he going to do it? He has to go into other areas, perhaps the area to my left, perhaps the area to my right, and get supply that he's no longer getting within his own area. Now, when he goes into this area over here, he's not going to get the supply at the same price that the packer in that area has been getting it, because after all, this packer is, has been dealt with by these farmers for years. So if this fellow in the center wants a bigger supply, he's going to have to go into that area and bid a higher price than that packer is bidding. So he starts getting a few hogs. Now what's that fellow going to do over there? And let's say the fellow on my left over here that he's also gone into his area and taken a supply out of there. If either one of these two want to stay in business, they're going to have to meet that raise. So the next day they meet this 25 or 50 cent raise that this fellow in the center has offered to increase his supply. So he's back at the same place that he was the day before. He's still not going to get any. So he's going to have to raise the price once more. And these fellows are not going to let him have it. They're going to meet that competition. So for the first time, we have competition back into the market. And this is what gave the American farmer the additional $5 on hogs and the additional $3 on cattle. Now, there's only one reason why it's been more effective on hogs than it has cattle. First of all, the NFO didn't start as early with the cattle as they did with hogs. In the second place, we haven't had the cooperation or haven't worked it as hard as we have the hogs to see to it that the competition was brought. And this is what we're developing at this point getting the American farmer to realize that he is going to have to start in this er orderly marketing procedure, supplying packers that will remain competitive, uh, supplying them with a good grade where they get paid w on the quality that they produce, and the more farmers do join in in the NFO marketing operation, the more sure they are that they're going to keep the advance that the NFO has, uh, has received for them. Now, if these marketing arrangements should break down and every effort is being made, it's going to cost the American farmer no less than $5 per hundred on hogs. It's going to cost him no less than $3 on, on cattle. So it's up to the farmers themselves. Do you want a price? If you do, get with it and start cooperating with the one group that is really working for the American farmer. Phil, do you have any more comments to make? Uh, just one little story. This came about in a conversation that Fred Deerdorf from Missouri was having with the representative of one of the biggest packers. He told Fred that he felt that the NFO was responsible for at least $4 of the gain in hog prices. And he also said the thing that you just now mentioned, that if uh, farmers fell apart and didn't market together as they'd been doing under NFO, they were going to lose it. I would say just this to you. If your city cousins say, is the NFO causing some of this uh, raise in livestock prices? I'd say, be modest, but admit it. That for today is something to think about. Our special guests today have been Earhart Pinkston and Phil Allen. For more information on how to strengthen our nation's economy, contact this station or the NFO in Corning, Iowa, preceding a videotape production. <laughs>